the VAR show the one place for your weekly football update Hola very warm welcome to the VAR show the show which talks about all the various major football leagues in detail today we are going to go near theme of interviews and we have former new zealand manager former maldives national team manager and former northeast united manager mr ricky lloyd herbert with us so ricky lloyd herbert is a new zealand former football player and former head coach of the new zealand national team so he stepped down after the side failed to qualify for the 2014 world cup and he's also former manager of a league side wellington phoenix Herbert represented his country at the 1982 FIFA World Cup in Spain and coached the Na- New Zealand national team at the 2010 World Cup. His most recent role in international football was the being the head coach of Maldives national football team. He is currently the manager of Ba FC. So without wasting much time I would like to first thank Ricky for coming on the show. Thank you so much and welcome to the show and I'd like to begin by asking you how are you and what are you doing during this pandemic period? Yeah, thank you very much and uh look a real pleasure to be uh, part of your program and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um yeah, look it's been uh it's been interesting times and very difficult times I guess uh, right around the world as we know globally. Um but fortunately in New Zealand we have started to curb uh the virus. Um the last 10 days we have been case free. So uh yes, it's, it's it's looking very healthy and looking very positive and um hopefully we can continue with the curve uh remaining very very stable so you know let's get to a lighter topic that is football in comparison to the rest of the world what's happening so uh i'll talk about your career you are so well traveled in terms of your coaching career you know like you have experienced so many cultures all around the world actually so how diverse is the culture you know like according to your experience in terms of football Yeah look um yeah 100% right it's been uh, certainly a great journey and um hopefully there's many more journeys along the way as well but um yeah look I've been very fortunate not only to uh to sort of play and manage my own country um through through a world cup campaign which was um very very strong and and, and good from a a nation perspective um but as you say uh very very diverse I mean coaching in India coaching in Maldives uh recently coaching in um one of the Fijian uh, club sides bar in a Oceania uh, Champions League uh, program um also been in Papua New Guinea uh, where I took the under 23 side through a campaign there um so look lots of different um flavors uh, five and a half years with the Wellington Phoenix in the A league so yeah look I've had um I've had really really good opportunities and uh, look I've loved the, the the chance of being able to be abroad um I love experiencing the different cultures and and working and and uh understanding how they operate um and linking that back into sport um and and football as uh I'm I'm sure we mutually love the the code. So you know you have uh, participated in the World Cup as a player and as a coach. How does it feel to you know like participate in such a grand scale? Yeah, look, I think um, you know, I wouldn't have been any different than any young child growing up. Um totally loved the game, began playing football in New Zealand when I was 4. Um so, you know, I guess to to still be involved in the sport heavily like I am now and and to have, you know, graced the fields at a World Cup was just an absolute true privilege and um as a player I was only 21 at the World Cup in 1982 in Spain. Um and played a part in all of the three games and then um roll the clock forward a number of years in 2020 had a chance and uh, led led the national team back through the management side and coaching uh, to the World Cup in South Africa so um probably totally different uh, opportunities and I think um obviously being young and being a player probably more so from an individual perspective but uh, the management side was was just a real thrill I think you know guiding some really really talented management people um in the group but uh, some wonderful players as well So you know like we'll talk about your uh, stint at India you have been involved in Indian football I think with North East United in 2014 how is the or how was the in, uh, Indian footballing culture in your experience in maybe in comparison to 
maybe a New Zealand or maybe Maldives? Yeah, look, it was interesting because um, we'd actually travelled there with the Wellington Phoenix, the A-League team, and uh, hence the connection getting into North East, so uh, partly owned um, in, in a small way by the owner of the uh, um, club in Shillong. Um, and uh, that connection back to uh, to the owner of the, the uh, North East, um, as you know, the Bollywood actor. So... Um, and, and that was just a, that was a true privilege as well. But I think back then, very early times, and I think, um, you know, interesting opportunity, I think, for Indian football to, to lead and sort of put a stake in the ground to guide some young players through a professional opportunity. And I think back then, the recruitment of the overseas players was probably a little more broader. Um, and I think now, as I, as I look from afar to to what they're doing and the types of international players that are coming into the country, but more importantly, the talented Indian boys that have progressed over the last sort of five to six seasons has been very refreshing and good to see. So, yeah, the culture was challenging, I think, um, when we first started. I think, you know, just fundamentally getting across what a, a professional footballer really needed to do. And, and, and that, that was, you know, 24 hours of the day, uh, not two hours at a training session. So, um, we were, you know, with, with North East, we had all the very young boys from Shillong. So, um, you know, it was, a, it was a, 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 a good challenge. You know, I think when I look back on that, it was, you know, while some of those boys were very young and the other franchises were picking up all the best young players from a, around the country, it, it was nice to have the chance to provide those boys. And, and, I, and I sense and still see some of them playing now. So, um, but look, it didn't take long, I think. You know, if you, if you walk in with your eyes wide open and, and your heart very much in it um, and you're prepared to connect and, and communicate with people, um, then I think the balance of the time, you know, whether it's a long period or not within the country is, is more obtainable and I think um, probably more mutual across the board from, from people locally and, um, you know, from myself coming in as, as, as being seen as a foreign person. But uh, no different in the Maldives, different, different culture, lovely people um and, and i think it's you know it's just working out kind of where those types of countries or clubs or leagues or you know making world cups or going further just you know what it really takes and um sometimes it's just having those i guess more meaningful conversations with the right people to say unfortunately it does take a little bit of time and uh, sometimes you don't get the time so you know like uh, after your northeast stint you're very close or you i can even go on to say you're very you're one of the favorites to be appointed the head coach of indian national team i think in 2015 but ultimately you know i i don't know why it did not happen but could you shed some light on the topic as to why it did not happen from your perspective at least if you're comfortable yeah look i don't really know why it didn't happen um but uh, you know look I, I i totally respect i mean i've been in the footballing industry all my life um and applications and opportunities, I think, um, you know, within international teams or club teams. And sometimes it's, uh, it falls your way and sometimes it doesn't. And, um, you know, Steve Constantine did a wonderful job with the, with the national team. And I think, you know, to take them through to different areas and, and, and different levels that they've been in the past was, a, you know, a true credit to, you know, to his work and the dedication that he put forward into it. So, you know, I applaud what he'd done. But, um, yeah, look, I've, I've always been very very keen on on the Indian sort of role I think it's um, uh, forget the size of the population I think it just has a it has a great opportunity to to kind of embark and be slightly more powerful within the Asian market and um, you know if they could break through out of their group at some point and and just be a little bit more challenging and perhaps you know getting a little further to, to show the exposure and what those challenges could look like would be wonderful for a, for a country like India so um, I never give up hope so hopefully one day so you know like uh, in New Zealand you also have your academies a lot of academies all over New Zealand so did you always have a plan or did you always want to start academy back home yeah look at uh, it really come to fruition uh, around about 2008 um, and it probably got some momentum probably post that about two, uh, 2012, 2013. So, um, yeah, look, we've got 10 centres that operate around the North Island, um, ranging from sort of six-year-old children through to 14. We are expanding it uh, coming on August the 1st to 15 to 17-year-old players, both male and female. 
And, um, you know, we're sensing in New Zealand that there's a real drive, there's a real enthusiasm, and there's really good numbers and appetite um, for young players, again, both male and female, that, um, you know, want to sense and taste and, and have an opportunity of perhaps seeing what professional football could be like at some stage. So, uh, yeah, we're very lucky. We've got some great kids um, as part of our program and uh, perhaps someday we can journey to, to India or, you know, invite some players or teams to, to travel to New Zealand to uh, experience what we're doing here as well. So, you know, like you have been in the coaching world for quite some time and if you had to describe your philosophy, what would that be? Yeah, look, it's it's a wonderful question, and I think um, you know around the world there's there's just the pinnacle of so many talented coaches, and and you're always listening and looking and observing to to kind of see what different directions they're taking. And I think you know the modern game now compared to you know 1982 when I was playing, the vast differences. But uh, yeah, for me, I think it's you know just that that real planned orientation, organisation, you know, fully having the confidence and and the understanding of what you want to do. Um, I think some of the environments that I had been in probably over the past sort of 10 years have probably had areas that they really haven't had that um, that depth and real clarity on where they wanted to go. So I, so I guess we had to sort of unfold that a little bit and, and sort of peel that back and put a plan in place and whether that was going to be the right one strategically, I guess there was going to be a few challenges and trials along the way. So um, sometimes we got it right, sometimes we didn't. But um, look, I think, you know, from a playing philosophy perspective, technically good players, you know, the pace and drive of players now just physically around the world is, is very, very dominant. But, you know, I've always maintained and, and always said right the way through my academy sort of philosophy that, um, you know, technical proficiency, um, you know, being able to receive the ball with all parts of the body from the head to the toe and being able to make defined decisions with one touch um, is probably the pinnacle of, of, you know, being able to get to execute things at a higher level. And the more we can generate and, and more we can excite and, and elevate players to that level, then... Uh, but, yeah, look, I'm, I'm a very connected coach. I love working with players. I have good relationships with players. Sometimes you leave them out of the team and the relationships are, uh, are not so strong. But, um, you know, generally speaking, I think, um, you know, I've connected well back onto those. And uh, But, you know, as I say, it takes time to, to roll your philosophies out at times. And uh, some people are a little more patient than others. But, um, yeah, look, I, I thoroughly enjoy and any other opportunities come my way. I'll, uh, I'll certainly be giving it my best as well. So, you know, if you had to uh, choose one formation as a go-to formation, what would that be? Yeah, look, I think, well, 4-3-3, I think, it's at, at some point, just it provides a little bit more rotation and a little bit more movement on the field, you know. When you've got three players, whether you're playing a holding midfield player or you've got two screening midfield players in front of your back four, I think it just gives that permutation of, you know, players being able to move, uh, rotate, um, probably operate in triangles a little more fluidly than probably a standardised 4-4-2 where it's a little bit more tram-lined, perhaps a little bit more predictable and, and you maybe don't get quite the same movement. Um, I say that generally um, more so through the younger uh, generation of players coming through and uh, we're very conscious of, you know, through our academy that once the, the children hit 11 that we do formalize a 433 just to allow that that knowledge of an expansion and i think physiologically the, the the players need to be better and at a much more higher level through a whole range of testing to be able to exploit that system really really well um, having said that at the world cup we played 343 um, we hadn't played that we were playing 433 through the qualifying period but we changed and it worked successfully for us so um, Sometimes it's a little bit the cavalry that uh, that you've got and the players that you have um, under your tutelage. Other times you have a little bit more time to shape and look at the organisation. But yeah, a very fluid passing, technically based um, system that uh, allows for that sort of rotation and uh, quality of retaining the ball moving forward. So, you know, you have managed at club level, that was your most recent with Bar FC, and you have managed at a lot of countries. Which one do you prefer, the national level or the club level? 
Yeah, again, you're asking some wonderful questions and uh, very, very good questions. But uh, yeah, look, I think day-to-day -day activity uh, on the grass from a club perspective is always very exciting. Um, you know, there tends to be that challenge coming, you know, a week, five days, six days, seven days later. Um, you know, you can be on the crest of a wave and winning or you could be losing a match, but you do have, you know, a relatively quick time to turn around. Uh, players are back recovering the next day. You're back on the field the next day. Um, so that's really exciting. The, the national team is, is a little bit, what can you do in 48 hours or 72 hours? Certainly in the, in the international window where the time frame is very limited. Um, but going through a World Cup campaign, and we are very fortunate in 2010 to, to go through that, you know, we set our stall out four years before we qualified for the World Cup. We tried, experimented through management, through some of the coaching methods that we had to some of the delivery we had to the players, to some of the strategies and tactics that we wanted to use. So we had a, a, a lot longer time frame to, to probably get a feel for that. But um, look, I, I, I enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy the day-to-day -day activity. I think there's nothing better than waking up the next morning and uh, win, lose or draw, knowing that you're putting your training kit on and you're back onto the training pitch. So um, it probably gets a little bit of a tick more than the international, but uh, I certainly wouldn't swap one for the other. So, you know, you have worked with, uh, like, as I said, a lot of uh, national teams, but most of them were not really big, super powerful countries in terms of football. No, no disrespect to anyone, but do you feel like uh, it's difficult to work in those environments, maybe in terms of infrastructure or something? Yeah, look, it can be. And I think um, sometimes when you're going through a... Um, uh, a negotiation to maybe come on board, certainly from a country perspective, then I think it's always good to, to have the understanding and vision of the chairman and the board on where they feel that that country needs to be at certain periods of time. And as you say, if you're coming into a, a, a slightly more challenging environment, and that could be, you know, financially, it could be playing numbers, it could be just strength of the, of the, of the players that you have, then if the period's very, very short, um, then that can have challenges as well. I think if there's if there's a amicable arrangement from a time perspective and a very, very clear understanding, and I guess from a presentation point of view, that's where I would head anyway when I was, you know, presenting to any potential sort of role that may be available, that there was some real clarity towards the key people, the key stakeholders that were... Um, going to be making final decisions that they had some comfort to know where we were heading um, and what we were doing. But look, I'm a Kiwi kid and I think we love challenges in New Zealand. I think, you know, characteristic of New Zealand people, we, we, we were very, we're very determined, we're very uh, likeable and communicate very well, but we don't mind that challenge side of things. And uh, as you've mentioned, I mean, some of the roles I've had have been very challenging given the, the, the outcomes that possibly people were looking at achieving short term as opposed to where they could be in sort of five to ten years time and, and interesting to note that some of the biggest countries in the world some of the you know top you know even germany uh japan for example that rolled out a 10-year strategy to actually you know find a way that they could attend a world cup on a regular basis every four years and through the cycle so even countries at the you know the sharp end of football that are doing extremely well have long-term vision as well so um yeah i'm not saying that you're going to get a job for 10 years but i think from an infrastructure point of view you know it's great when you're sitting in a meeting uh, applying for a job and you just get that real sense and feeling that you know the board is leading that country or that club you know further down the track and, and if you stay a year or two years or three years then you can certainly play a part in that so the next question is a bit lighter compared to what I've asked. So would Ricky Herbert, the player, get in your team? Uh, yeah, look, I, I, I guess from my perspective, um, I, I, I was always very hard working. I was, I, was, I was very lucky. I was only very young when I made the national team in New Zealand at 18. Played over 80 caps for my country, uh, all, all the games at the World Cup um, when I was only 21. So, um, you know, I look back in my days and think, you know, I trained every day, I worked very hard. There wasn't the sports science, there wasn't the teaching of kind of what you needed to do on a regular basis. 
and I think I really had that self-driven motivation to um, to be the athlete that I really wanted to be, and I knew that I could be, um, and align that to being very, very strong and capable of playing a position that I thought I could do very well. Um, there were areas on the park that weren't going to be my strengths, um, so you know I was very focused on on concentrating. I play I played. Um, primarily as a defender, whether it was centrally or on the right-hand side. And, and, I, and I just made the best that I possibly could do in that position, which um, gave me the best chance and certainly gave me some some wonderful moments. So, uh, next question will be probably difficult for you because uh, you've had so much success in over your career in different, maybe as a player, as a coach. If you had to choose one moment from Okay, I'll give you the liberty of choosing one for playing and one for uh, coaching. Which will be the moment like which you will cherish for the rest of your life? Uh, look, I think as a player and I think as any sort of childhood dream growing up, I mean, we had Brazil in our group in the World Cup and um, to be walking out onto the field with, you know, Socrates, Junior, Zico, Falcao, um, you know, was just a, a stunning moment. As I say, I was, I was only very young, 21 years of age. And to play up against, you know, arguably some of the best players ever to, to have represented their country on the global sort of market was uh, just a just a true privilege. And, um, and 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 again, I think leading, you know, from a from a coaching perspective, when we qualified for the World Cup, we qualified at home in Wellington, you know, forty odd thousand people, for, you know, sold out stadium. We'd actually captured the nation's sort of attention, and I think. As you'd know, in New Zealand, rugby is a, is a superpower. The All Blacks are the best in the world. Um, but that actually, you know, that, that game actually stopped the nation in its tracks. And we had some wonderful support right throughout the country. So just from a personal uh, child growing up in New Zealand and that feel-good factor, you know, that was certainly a very honourable and, and true privilege to, to get the team over the line on that occasion. But I suppose when I look at it from a coaching point of view, um, you know, we had Italy in our group and um, who, who would have thought this little four-year-old boy who grew up in South Auckland and uh, would go to, to manage and, and, and lead his, his side from a coaching perspective out onto the field against Italy, who at that stage in 2010 were the world champions. Um, the result was fantastic for us to draw one all. Um, so I think those, those, those probably two occasions, there's probably a couple there from a coaching perspective. Um, you know, I can look back and say, look, when I got appointed as the national coach for New Zealand, that was a remarkable sort of privilege. Um, so there probably tends to be, you know, one or two more on the coaching side. But um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I've been very lucky to have had the chance in both those entities. So I think you all went undefeated in the World Cup. I'm not sure on that. Did you all go undefeated? Yeah, I think there's a po very popular pop quiz, you know, like uh, question, like exactly. which team has gone undefeated? <laughs> So, you know, like my next question, like how you said about uh, rugby being the main sport in New Zealand. Again, I don't know about Maldives personally because I don't know what which all sports they play. But uh, maybe in India, maybe in, in New Zealand, let's just take this too. You have always uh, coached in those countries which have football as maybe the secondary or maybe even third uh, uh, most uh, popular sport. How difficult it is to maybe, you know, make it popular according to you. Yeah, again, again, an excellent question. And I think um, in, in New Zealand, interesting that, you know, the All Blacks are the best in the world. So there's there's an absolute captive market for that when they play. From a particip uh, participation perspective, football is the biggest in New Zealand. So there's more children up to probably the age of 14 that play football than any other code in New Zealand. Um, but when you've got Super 15 on your back doorstep, you've got you know the the All Blacks playing locally in New Zealand and and winning World Cups, then it it's you know it gets incredible support as you would expect. Um, but look, I think it's again I think it's just respectfully trying to position the sport within those countries and um, you know the wonderful time that I had in India. I mean you you, you could just sense the, the the real passion for cricket and I think everywhere you went around the country there was children playing cricket, but. You know, in the time span I had there, the first year with North Northeast, and then I had a couple of a couple of years doing the Star Sports uh, commentary and television, that you just could see so many more young children kicking a football, and I think it's just positioning without being unrealistic on where those countries can be, um, 
you know, what sort of drives and motivates. And again, you know, I come back to, you know, the desire of the board, the chairman, what are the governments like in those countries to lend support and finance to, to help, you know, drive those, those codes further forward um, to give them an opportunity to be on the world stage and, and perform and showcase their players on a much more regular basis. So um, I think there's, there's certainly positions, certainly the countries I've been in, I think India, I mean, football was far more down the track now than it was, you know, five, six years ago. Uh, Maldives, they love their football. Um, you know, how far they can go, who knows? Uh, wonderful people, it was a great challenge. Um, but again, like I say, w wonderful question, but I think there's, there's, there's a number of parties that can play a part in kind of positioning the sport to a higher level that, uh, you know, you can actually extract or, or, or look to get the best out of, you know, the players that you possibly can. So, you know, uh, do you have any coach, coach or coaches from whom you have taken inspiration maybe throughout your career? Yeah, look, I've just I've just put an article out into one of the Australian papers um, on the A-League and kind of where that's going to be heading over the next period of time. And because um, I think that's a very positive story, you know, albeit the, the pandemic and COVID-19, I think, you know, as things start to eliminate, then... Um, you know, something like the A-League could move forward. And, you know, one of the questions there was, um, I was very fortunate because through my coach education, I did my higher licenses, my A license and my professional license in England. So uh, Brendan Rogers, the current Leicester City coach, was, was part of that panel that we worked on. You know, I got to see Gareth Southgate, the current England manager, work extensively. Uh, Roy Keane was part of my group um, through my pro license. So I was very lucky to see some coaches that have gone on to, to work at the sharp end of the game through EPL, you know, national teams at the highest level and World Cups, um, you know, club football at the highest level, you know, coming through and, and watching how they, you know, took on board the educational side, delivered, you know, some of their sessions. And, you know, so I've always valued being in those environments and I was very lucky to be invited into those environments and um, consequently got my pro licence, which was you know, huge for me being from New Zealand, but uh, got it coming out of Europe. Um, so look, I think that was the platform that, you know, really gave me the chance to see, you know, different strategies, different tactics, different opinions. Um, the game's great, isn't it? You know, we all think um, we, we have the right recipes, but, um, you know, we are sort of deemed as, as chefs and cooks that, uh, you know, we throw a lot of ingredients in and at the end of the day, we're hoping that we uh, produce the right recipe and right right meal at the end of the day. But uh, there's always a lot of banter, a lot of good conversation around what, what could be or, or sometimes what night might, what night might be. But uh, yeah, very, very, uh, very lucky to have been in that company, but uh, certainly treasured that, that chance to build my own platform. You know, the next question, of course, you will be, you'll, you'll have, you'll have got asked a lot of times and I'll ask you again, do you have any advice for any young coaches coming up? Yeah, look, I think be very, very open-minded. You know, I think the game, you know, and, and we're very lucky, the game is always evolving. And I think, um, you know, there'll be a blueprint, you know, at times we see, you know, we've got Jurgen Klopp now doing remarkable things at Liverpool and, um, Quite a quite a grand set and change and and kind of what they've done and what they've managed to achieve, but it tends to run cycles and I think, you know, when when you're young and coming through, you, at times you can be very uh, convinced or very uh, dominant on what your thoughts need to be, and solely might need to be. So I'd be I'd be very I'd be very clear to 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 be very open minded. Yes, you need your principles and you need to have a plan and you need to be organised. Um, you need to be comfortable in what you're doing and fully understand what you're doing and, and how that's going to be delivered. But I think be open-minded and see what's happening around the world because there's some fantastic things. You know, there's some great coaches with some good insight. And I always say to a number of young coaches, if I, if I come across them through a, you know, a presentation or, or something, that the best coaches in the world don't retain their jobs all the time either. So it's, you know, it's a fluent market. It's a challenging market. And I think the more you're open to communication, understanding what's happening tomorrow as opposed to what happened yesterday, um, where's the game evolving, where's it heading to, and, and just primarily trying to stay in front, you know, in front of the line all the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, look, it's a great journey. And um, 
sometimes you need to fall to, to fully understand what it's like to, to, to bounce back. And uh, like those old sayings, it's uh, it's not how hard you fall, it's how, how quickly you can get back on that sort of horse. So, um, yeah. So on that note, I'll ask you one final question, Ricky. It's probably even more difficult than choosing your maybe 11 starting against Italy in the World Cup. And it's a very controversial question. Whom do you prefer, Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo? Yeah, it is. It's a it's a global it's a global question, isn't it? And I was very lucky. I got invited by FIFA to the Ballon d'Or Awards um, in Italy, um, and you know, just to be in the presence of of, of I mean, that, that's that's two remarkably talented world class players. Um, but the night was was sort of littered with you know an array of talent that uh, you know you're kind of pinching your skin to to be part of. But uh, yeah, uh, to to me they're different. Um, you know, I think they're different types of players. Um, I've been very fortunate to see them both play live. Um, where where would I head? What would I do? I mean, I I, I guess you're saying I can't sit on the fence. And, no, uh, okay, I'll make it easier for you. If tomorrow you are facing a team, whom would you least want to face, Ronaldo or Messi? Oh, look, I think I'd, 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 I'd probably inch towards Messi. Um, and and look, I, you know, I I say that with the most you know utmost respect for for both, who are for me just the most wonderful players that we've we've had an opportunity to to see. Um, and witness and, and just be privileged to, to see their qualities. But um, yeah, I mean, because we're on because we're on the show tonight, I'll, I'll, I'll lean slight, slightly towards Messi. So on that note, Ricky, thank you so much for talking to me, and I wish you all the best for future campaigns. I hope you lead New Zealand again to one more World Cup and maybe even win it. You never know. So thank you so much for coming, and best of luck and stay safe. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. Stay safe yourself. Take care.